Hi, everybody. Hello. Can you hear me okay if I'm standing what? with the microphone? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, cool. So, uh, my name is Megan Sweet, and my presentation is called Level Up for Beginning Themers and Site Builders. So, um, just to give you guys a little bit of um, heads up as to far as what to expect with this presentation, um, I'm kind of going to assume you've maybe played with Drupal a little bit, you're familiar with a, what a node is, what a block is, you've installed Drupal successfully. Um, so we're going to be kind of talking Drupal, but I'm, I'm trying to capture like a lot of different skill ranges for people who maybe are new to site building, maybe they um, inherited a site, or maybe they're just trying to kind of figure out how to level up or kind of move forward as far as their um, ability to, to really make Drupal do what you want. Um, I really believe in kind of like an open space. If you feel at any time that you were in the wrong session and you'd rather be somewhere else, feel free to just get up and leave. I, even if it's at the end, I don't care. I won't be offended. Um, and I think that's it for that. Um, to give you guys just a little bit more background about me, um, I work at Chapter 3, which is a Drupal shop in San Francisco. And I am a themer, and I am a developer in our support department. So I work with a lot of different Drupal sites, uh, some of which we built in-house, some of which we haven't. And yeah, and I also do trainings. So I kind of get to do a little bit of everything there, which is really fun. Um, so Drupal is one of these things that people get into in many different ways. And I just kind of want to gauge the audience as far as where you guys are at so I can kind of tailor um, the what I talk about to you. Um, so who here is um, a content administrator, they add content to a site, a Drupal site? Okay. Um, who has in successfully installed Drupal on their own and built a simple site? Okay. Um, who has um, you know, used contributed modules, custom themes to really kind of make a more robust Drupal site? Sweet. Um, has anyone here, a themer, done some kind of custom theme work? Okay. And do we have any developers? Cool. So we got kind of a good mix of stuff going on. So if you've been working in Drupal, you know that sometimes things are really easy, and that is really exciting. Sometimes you're like, you know, I might really want my website to have a map function. You go onto Drupal.org, you find a map module, and you plug it in, and everything works, and you're like, yes, this is great. This is why I love Drupal. I didn't have to write any of this code, and it works beautifully. I'm so excited. Um, you may also realize through your Drupal experience that sometimes things are really hard, and sometimes you have the exact opposite experience where you're like, I want this to be really easy, and I feel like I could be really easy if I just did it one way, but I just can't figure out how to do it, and I don't really know why it's so hard, and it just seems so simple. All I want to do is change, like, what it says on the login form, and I just can't figure out how to do it. Um, so, you know, it's kind of a split world as far as, like, when you're new to Drupal or even any, any real level until you get to that kind of, like, hardcore, I can do anything in Drupal. Um, you're, there's still going to find things that you encounter that are just seem, like, difficult to do and some things that seem easy. Um, but one thing that the Drupal community really allows you to do is leverage um, the code that's out there. So you can really stand on the shoulders of giants as far as being able to um, find contributed modules that really work for you um, and, and bring them into your site. So if you haven't checked the statistics recently, there are currently 17,000 modules on Drupal.org. So that is quite a lot of contributed um, stuff out there to really make your website do what you want it to do. Um, and if you're, that can be also a little bit overwhelming if you're trying to figure out the best module to do something or you're trying to figure out some kind of functionality and how to go about it. You're like, wow, 17,000, how do I even begin to kind of parse down what the best one might be? Uh, I think that uh, that skill comes from being able to assess the project page really well, um, being able to check out a, a module on Drupal.org and read through it and and have enough background to realize, like, okay, is this good or not, and sort of understand the Drupal project enough to, um, to be able to assess. So, like, if you haven't really dove, div, uh, dived in deeply to the way that the uh, project page is, I have a couple screenshots here. 
So for example, like the maintainers, this is a views module um, that you would go to just through Drupal.org project views. If you're checking out the maintainers for a project, you can see things like when was the last time it was committed. So for views three days ago, five days ago for two of the maintainers, you're like, okay, this is, this is looking pretty good. It's pretty active. They're pushing things to code really frequently. If you were to see this and it would be like two years ago, three years ago, that should be like a red flag for you that maybe this isn't like a module you should really consider for, especially for a production site. Um, if it really does what you need, you know, it might still be worth testing, but you know, if something's not really actively maintained, it, it might be because there's something better and the people who were developing that module realize that there's some other place they can be putting their energy, maybe a better way to do it. Um, so you can also check out, to see how active the module is, you can check out the issues. So if you see there, it says, under that search bar, it says all issues, almost 2,000 open, but also 16,000 closed. So you may see that and be like, wow, there's 2,000 bugs on views. Like, that sounds horrible. That's going to really mess up my site. I don't want to deal with that many bugs. But it's really about a ratio as far as how many are open and how many are total. And you can see that there's a lot of total issues that have been closed. So that's a sign that things are really moving along and that maintainers are actively working on that project. Um, also, in the issue queue, if you're not that familiar with spending time in there, you'll, you'll realize over time that there's like a lot of duplicates. A lot of times people are really asking more for support than they are reporting a bug. So just because something's an issue doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem with the project. It might just be some sort of clarification needed. Um, and finally, the last statistic I like to look at on this page um, is, is kind of the bottom of the page. Obviously, reading the description of the module is really important to get a conceptual understanding. But also just checking out the recorded number of installs and the total number of downloads. You should know that that's a little skewed because it's determined by whether you have this module on your Drupal site enabled called update, which basically pings Drupal to find out if there's any updates for modules. So if a site has that turned off, then they're not reporting back to Drupal that they're actually using the module. So while it says like almost half a million people or sites are using views, it's probably a lot more than that. So, but at least it's consistent across all of the Drupal projects. Um, so all in all, if you were assessing views, I think it would be a really good bet. Um, it's also the most popular module for Drupal. So it's kind of a solid example. But those are just some things to kind of check out. Um, Another really good practice is to just read the README file of a module. This is something I didn't realize I should be doing until way too late. Um, if you're ever wondering, like, you install a module and it doesn't seem obvious what it's supposed to be doing, like, you're like, well, now what? Um, oftentimes in the README file, there will be information like, okay, this is where the uh, configuration settings live in the Drupal admin toolbar. This is sort of how you go about configuring things. And so checking that space out and kind of reading things over, it will give you step-by-step -step instructions if you have to do more stuff, like maybe getting a library from somewhere. Um, so checking that out, it, it can save you a lot of time from just trying to figure it out the hard way. Um, another just kind of like thing that new people tend to do in Drupal is put their modules in the wrong place in your, in your site structure. So because when you download Drupal core, you'll see that there's two folders, one called themes and one called modules. And oftentimes people think, oh, modules, themes, that's where I put the stuff I download off of Drupal.org. But really, you want to keep everything into a separate folder, which is the sites folder. And so in sites, all modules is where you want to put all the modules that you download. And that way, when you're updating Drupal later on, you're not going to override all the stuff that you put into the core files. Um, I, th I threw a couple like you know good modules to check out. I'm, you guys seem like you have a lot of Drupal experience, so you probably are already using views, admin menu, and see tools, and web form, and panels, and context on your sites. But if you haven't checked some of those projects out, they're definitely some of the like most popular fundamental Drupal modules. So as far as what you need in your toolbox to kind of level up as a uh, Drupal site builder, developer. Um, you know, the kind of fundamental understanding of HTML and CSS goes a really long way. Um, I added JavaScript in there as kind of like an optional thing. I think, you know, JavaScript can make your site do fancy things and it can make it do cool stuff, but you don't necessarily have to be a JavaScript master to have a really nice site. Um, well, willingness to build rapport with PHP is kind of how I frame what I think is a good approach to um, moving forward with learning PHP is if you don't have a background in it or if you don't have like a strong computer science background at all. 
Um, I can say, like, from my experience, I sort of learned it incrementally as I needed it. So there wasn't some point where I was just like, all right, I need to learn PHP, and today's the day, and I'm just going to sit down and learn it. I really kind of did it slowly. Okay, like, what do I need to do? You know, starting with maybe some template files in a theme, moving into doing some pre-process functions, finally starting to write some custom modules. So really kind of doing it slowly and just checking out what's already out there, reading it, and trying to understand it as you go along. I would say it's kind of a good like mental space to be in as you're trying to dive more into Drupal. Um, as basics of the command line is like another good thing that's just starting to get yourself warmed up to if you don't have a background in that. Um, mostly because Drush is this really amazing tool for building with Drupal, and if you aren't using it, it's I highly recommend working towards um, being able to use it. It's actually pretty easy to install. It's really well documented, and you don't really have to know very much like command line stuff to be able to use it. So um, that's something that's that is probably worth like you know a weekend project. Let's get Drush going. Let's practice some commands um, because it allows you to do really great stuff like just download modules on the fly just by like typing into your command line, download a module, um, and you know enable a module. Things that you would normally have to like go to Drupal.org, download it, drop it into your sites. So. Once you start using it, you realize it's like this Swiss army knife for Drupal development and probably won't look back. Um, version control is another one of those big um, items that you know sometimes takes a little while for people to warm up to. Um, but using a version control, Drupal.org uses Git, and Git is my preferred version control system, although there are tons of other options. Um, but using that, even if you're just a sole developer and not working on a team, um, using some kind of version control to maintain your code is really good practice. Um, and that kind of goes along with having different environments set up. So having a, a development site where you can really do your testing and then having a production site where your like, live code works for your live site. And then having an intermediary called a test server where you can kind of test things that you did on your sandbox before you push them all the way to your live site. So having that kind of system of having different websites where you work on your development in different cases really helps um, just keep your process, your development process clean. Um, there's a cool um, service out there um, called Pantheon, um, which sets all that up for you and it's free for uh, developers. And I believe Acquia has a similar product um, that I haven't checked out, but that can be kind of a good way to get yourself going because um, they will have those environments set up for you and you can kind of like ease yourself into using version control or use like understanding conceptually how that um, three um, server kind of development process goes. Um, obviously the Drupal community is like a huge part of your toolbox and just you know leveraging what's out there on the internet and the people around you in your community and events like this is a really good way to kind of figure things out and learn how to do things maybe a way that you hadn't considered before. And I really believe you can leverage a lot of the skills you already have in order to build better Drupal sites. Um, even just things like how you think about um, the way sites are structured and just like looking at um, if you have design skills that can flow into site building. If you have a development background that can flow into um, site building. It's like everything can really be interconnected. So it's cool to be able to think about your outside skills and how that those kind of thinking can apply to Drupal development. So you may have heard this term is people say, do things the Drupal way. Um, and I, I just wanted to kind of discuss what that means a little bit. Um, as far as developing a site, a typical Drupal site is composed of about 80% core and contributed modules. So code that you don't write yourself. And about 20% is going to be custom, which includes things like your theme, or modifications you make to that. Um, and it's usually mostly the theme that's custom. And maybe you have a couple of custom modules that kind of get you over the edge if you have some unique functionality. But when you're thinking about Drupal, you really can think about it as mostly leveraging what's already out there and mostly just doing configuration to get it to work for you. So um, developing a site development plan and understanding the way Drupal works and to get you to that 80% or to that 90% or 100% um, ends up saving you a lot of time and frustration than just trying to kind of do things um, maybe a way you're more familiar with in another, um, coming from another way of web development. So this is a, um, a, a law of computer science. It says a complex system that works invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that works. 
So essentially, and it also follows from this is that complex systems that uh, the inverse is true. So basically what it's saying is that you can't start from a complex system. All complex systems start from basic systems. And I think that really applies to how to develop like a complex Drupal site. Essentially the way, approach I take is to build features zoomed in and then pull back to see how it all fits together. It may be kind of overwhelming to conceptualize, okay, how does everything on my site gonna work? How is everything interrelated? How are all of my views gonna work? But if you kind of start with like one feature, like one piece of content, build that out and then zoom out and be like, okay, how is this connected to other stuff on the site? And then you can start to build in the missing links. So kind of like starting from content first and moving out to your site structure and layout, I think is a, is a strong approach to making sure that you have those basic, simple, simpler uh, structures built out the way you want before you start to like configure everything on a more like bigger scale. So that kind of leads into like structuring content in general, which is one of these like kind of skills that maybe doesn't get as discussed as much in site building with Drupal, but I think it's really important, um, especially as we move like towards more and more mobile development because it becomes even more important to have your content really structured. So if you guys have had, had experience building maybe like a static HTML site or working with something like Dreamweaver, it's really just like one page where all of your code goes. But Drupal allows you to create fields and break up your content into lots of different categories, which are different pieces of content, which then allow you to control that content in different ways. So one thing I do notice with certain sites, especially if maybe it's their first couple Drupal sites, is they have a, people have a tendency to just have the body, the title and the body, and put everything into the body, all of your content into the body. But really what I would encourage is to think about how you can structure your content in um, at a higher higher level structure as far as teasing things out like you have a title but maybe you also have a subtitle maybe you also have a summary then maybe you have like a long summary and then maybe you have some other information that you want people to fill out so kind of even thinking about even if it's just text how can you tease those things out in order to have more control so that way when you come time to wanting to put something onto your home page or create a view, you have more power to pull just the parts you want rather than having just this huge body of text. Um, so especially true when mobile, when you're having to make these really important decisions about like what is the most important thing to show people because you can't show everyone everything on mobile. Um, so that allows you to kind of say, okay, I just, I just want the short description. I just want the, um, the subtitle here or I want to get rid of this or that and have a little bit more control that way. It's also really important when you're structuring your content to think about both your administrators and your visitors. So starting with the administrators, how are they gonna be entering content on your site? Um, how, how should they be thinking about? Like if you hand a site over to someone and it, all it has is one big body field, they might not really understand what they're supposed to put in there. But if you break it up into a lot of categories for them, it might become way more clear when they're creating content where everything's supposed to go. And that will lead to a more consistent look overall because you'll have more control over how things are displayed and the way they look. So, um, and then, you know, that helping your admins create content also helps your visitors. Because like I said, it just leads to more consistency and it allows you to create like more powerful dynamic displays. Um, this quote um, by a, a pretty well-known content strategist is good content is user-centered. Adopt the cognitive framework of your users. So all that's saying is try to put yourself in the shoes of your users. Try to think about who they are and where they're coming from. Are these like, are you developing a site for a newspaper where they have really complex like ways that they do things already and you want to like adopt that that system. Maybe you're building something for a nonprofit and they're going to have unique themes and you need to think about like how they're going to be creating content. So trying to really get into the shoes of the people who are going to be using your site and build for them will create a site that lasts longer, I think, over the long term. Another quick concept I just kind of wanted to throw out there and I'll just like reference you to this article. It's called um, SKU, um, the Front End Engineer's Misery. And it's just this concept that you know, as a front end developer, which in Drupal, in my mind, translates to being like a site builder themer, um, is that you, 
um, you have like all of the expectations of everyone else kind of falling onto your shoulders. So if you have someone who's working on the back end, they have certain expectations about how things are going to work. If you have a designer or a graphic designer, they have certain expectations. If you have a project manager or business or a client, everyone has all these different expectations about how things will work. And then it gets put onto the site builder and the themer to actually kind of come up with that whole system. So that's where that site architecture and like content strategy really come into play um, as and, and it can be kind of tricky to navigate that space. So I, I think there's some interesting discussions. I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some like common performance pitfalls because I think there's like some really easy wins that sometimes people overlook. And this is just talking about like client side performance. You can go like totally off in the other direction about talking about your server configuration. And that's kind of something I leave up to my uh, systems admins, but as a themer and a site builder, I take responsibility for stuff as far as th things on the front end, because even if your site is super well configured on the back end and it's lightning fast, you could still upload like a logo image that was like 500K and your site's gonna be slow. So I think a lot of it comes down to image optimization, um, honestly. If you aren't familiar with the Drupal built-in cache settings, it's under configuration. You go in and you just check a box that says, please cache all of my CSS and my JavaScript. And that will just um, take those files, which are oftentimes the biggest files on your site, and minify them. Not technically minify them, but um, put them all into one file so that the server only has to load that one file instead of like a whole bunch. So it's funny, but you would see even like really high profile Drupal sites that have neglected this. And in my training session, sometimes we'd take sites and kind of poke around them and figure out how they were built. And it's surprising the number of times this is just neglected. So making sure that's checked off in your configuration, optimizing your images, like when you save them, if you're working on an image in Photoshop, make sure you like save it for the web and optimize it so you're not saving like a huge JPEG. Um, image handling, that's another really important thing to make sure you're building into your sites is even if a user, and this is how you thinking about your users, is your user just going to upload like a huge image? Are they really going to take the time to like um, make it smaller? So having that done for them um, just by the image cache module, which is now built into Drupal 7, is like really smart. And I try to provide a lot of styles for people like so that it resizes for them. So here's like a big style, here's a smaller style, here's a thumbnail, and kind of let them pick and choose when they're uploading photos. Um, CSS images is another thing you might overlook. Um, you know, if you have a lot of custom buttons or you have a lot of social media links or if you have a logo, sometimes um, those files can be bigger than you might have realized and can kind of add up to a lot. Um, so optimizing those and also um, using CSS sprites is another way to kind of, um, if you aren't familiar with that, you essentially put all of your um, photos into one um, image, and then you use CSS to only display the part that you want. So you could have all of your social media buttons actually just be one image, and then just display a piece of them in the right place, and that way you only have to call one image and not six for each of your icons. Um, and also just the size of your pages, your libraries, and your CSS, that is really what kind of adds up the most. So if you're using like 50 different job, like jQuery plugins, that's probably going to slow your site down. Maybe you can narrow it down. Um, and there's a bunch of tools out there. If anyone was in the front end performance session this morning, um, there was like a whole bunch of tools that were listed as far as like ways to test your site and kind of find out where the slow points are. So I'll reference you guys to that. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch upon theming because um, this is really where everything can be overridden. It's um, as a themer, I get really excited about the theme layer because Drupal is doing all this kind of development magic in the background, and then you get to the theme and you can really make it do anything you want. Um, so I oftentimes get asked, oh, so like, what's the best theme? Um, if anyone is on the like Drupal themers group, there's been this really long email thread recently about the best theme for building responsive. And it's just been going on and on and on. And one of the quotes I really liked recently in someone's response was, just straight up, there is no best theme. Um, and I really, I really believe that to be true. I don't think that there is a best theme for any given situation. And as a themer, I really approach each project as a unique, um, as a unique project and try to find like a theme that kind of matches. So when you're getting started, I try to develop like a theming strategy and then try to find a theme that matches that. So it really depends on like what you're trying to accomplish and sort of your level of confidence as being able to manipulate a theme. 
So there's different options. If you're just looking through Drupal.org at all the themes, the themes sort of fall into different categories. Click to config is, you know, essentially a theme that's trying to give you as many options as possible from the configuration side of things. So they'll let you change things like your size of your grid or where things are laid out. And they'll let you change maybe even your fonts and your colors. And it's trying to put everything into the GUI UI as possible. So that can be really great for people who are kind of new and maybe aren't that um, comfortable with CSS or not that comfortable with like editing template files and they just want to be able to do as much as possible from the configuration side. Kind of leveling up from that, there's, um, at a certain point you might just get sick of doing things that way. You might get sick, or you might just get pushed beyond the boundaries of what the um, configuration can do for you. At which point you might want to start considering like a starter theme in which case you would find a theme that is like kind of close to what you want, and then you would build a base theme off of that where you would modify it to get it to look what, like the way you want it to. Um, there's also a bunch of base themes out there which are just really essentially um, simple, basic things like Zen is a, a very popular example um, where you can just, it has like the basic bones of a theme, but it really expects you to build it up on your own. So once you're kind of comfortable with the theme layer, a lot of people kind of move into that where they're saying, okay, I just want the basic essential stuff that you're going to do for me, and I'm going to build off of that and to build a really custom, custom look and feel. And now with responsive theming, it opens up so many new questions just as far as like how, what way you want to go about that. Um, you know, you can, can um, scroll through the Drupal.org themes that are available. There's some popular ones right now, like um, Omega um, is popular. Adaptive themes are... Um, responsive. I know Zen has been released as responsive. And if you like check out this, this is from Zen here at the bottom. You know, now you see, start to see charts like this on theme projects. Like, okay, well, what is it able to do? Is it mobile first? Does it have HTML5? So there's like all these new considerations to think about when you're choosing a theme, which didn't really necessarily exist even like a year or two ago. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to like wrap your head around all of it. I think it's really just approaching it from like, what is your skill level and what are you trying to accomplish and trying to find something that matches your style that you feel comfortable with. As far as theming goes, I always really recommend people to try to control the layout through configuration as much as possible. It may be tempting to just go in there and start writing all sorts of CSS, like float here, float here. Um, to get things to lay out the way you want, but it's more sustainable long term to um, use a, a, some kind of a contributed module to control the layout on your site. So there's a bunch of different options out there as far as how to do that. Panels and Panelizer and Panoply kind of fall into one group and one um, kind of philosophy around how to do that. Context and also Omega because it builds off of context um, is kind of another um, methodology as far as how to control content. And Display Suite is one that I haven't used very much, but I've been testing out lately, and it's really powerful, especially if you're not quite, your site doesn't quite require you to go the full length of using panels or using context. Display Suite is kind of an awesome intermediary where you can get a lot of layout control um, without having to like dive deep into the others. You may get to the point where the, you know, con controlling your um, configuration through the layout is just not um, enough for you, and you need to do some more advanced theming. So if you're thinking about advanced theming, just remember that it's all about overriding. Drupal will provide something to um, display. The theme will override that. And if you have a custom theme, it will override that. So your custom theme has the final say about how pretty much everything on, this, on your site will look. And so if you kind of think about it in that way when you're going to change things, it's really just about kind of moving things around or adding new things in more than it is about trying to like write from scratch because you're overriding something that's already been written. Um, and I just kind of have this um, pattern where it's like, okay, can I do it through configuration? Like, that is my first goal. If I can't do it through configuration, can I do it through CSS? If I can't do it through either of those, then I start to use PHP, where I start to really want to, like, control the way things look. So I kind of use PHP as a last resort. And the main reason for that is because the more custom code you have, the harder it is to maintain, and the harder it is for someone to come and look at it and really understand what's going on. So I think... Um, you know, all custom code that you add to your site, you're ultimately responsible for maintaining it. And if you're just using contributed things, then if there's security patches or updates that need to happen, someone else is doing that for you, and you can just benefit from that. So, um, you know, 
I've seen a lot of sites out there that just end up putting a bunch of custom code. Like I've seen people put PHP into blocks and I've seen people write crazy PHP in their template files and just kind of like throw their custom stuff all over the place. But if you're a little bit more systematic about it, I think like in the long term, you end up with a more sustainable project and you're not like, you know, kind of like hating your past self for putting you in that position. Um, that being said, I also believe in commenting and I don't have this in the slide, but I it kind of plays off of that, you know, even if you're just going in and modifying some CSS or adjusting something, commenting and leaving yourself a comment in the code, you will be so happy later on when you're trying to go back and find it again and you're like, why did I do that? Like, um, and even just commenting something out rather than deleting it can often be a good practice if you're developing because that way you don't just, it's not just gone, it's like, you, it's just hidden. Um, so there's different ways of commenting in your TPL files and your CSS, and if you don't really know how to do that, you can just look through one and, and see how it's done elsewhere. Um, but even if you're the only person working on your site and you're like, why should I need to comment? I, I already know. Like, I think even if it's a couple months down the line, you might totally forget why you did something. Or something might be unexpectedly broken, and if you ask a friend for help and they're like, I can't figure this out because like, you deleted a whole bunch of stuff and it's just not there anymore. Um, so commenting things out and leaving notes when you do things, I think is like really good practice. Um, giving back to the community, I think um, this is something that I didn't realize was as easy as it was until I started getting more into it. Um, and a lot of people, myself included, feel like, well, I'm not really a, um, I'm not really like a core developer and I can't contribute to the Drupal project, so I'm, I don't really want to have, you know, I'm not even going to put anything out there. But there's a lot of ways to get involved, um, and this is like a great way to kind of level up and to meet friends in the Drupal community who really know what they're doing, um, is to just put yourself out there and to help. And one way that's, um, that people who are new can really help a lot is through documentation. Um, I don't know if you've, like, ever seen a module on Drupal.org that has a description that is, like, almost... 100% un un understandable, um, but you do see that out there where the module developer is clearly the person who wrote it and they're writing it from their perspective, um, kind of with this huge curse of knowledge because they they understand how it works, but they're not really explaining it to a lay person. They're not putting themselves in anyone else's shoes. So even if you're that person, you're like, well, this is poorly written, but I still think this module is really useful, writing up like a layperson summary and submitting that, um, the module developer will probably be like, awesome, thank you so much. Um, similarly, if you ever run into something where, you know, you are trying to figure out how to use a module and you can't, and then eventually you finally succeed, even just taking brief notes as you go along about your process and submitting that as documentation will save other people so much time. And, you know, you can build cred that way as far as like your um, level of contribution in the Drupal community. Um, so documentation and just recording things, even having a blog, even if it feels kind of like new, like, I don't, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing. If you do, man if you do figure something out and you think other people would benefit just typing it up and putting it on your own blog is really helpful. I think we are, you know, everyone who works in Drupal is so grateful when you can just Google something and the answer comes up which is probably like 99% of the time for me. And that's because people out there have taken the time to write something up, even if it's just really simple. Um, and answering questions in the issue queue is another great way to kind of, you know, if you see something you know, just go in and answer the question. Um, a couple of um, notes for coding standards. There are pretty extensive coding standards for Drupal. A lot of them ap apply for when, apply specifically when you want to contribute something to the com to the community. So if you're contributing a module or you're contributing a theme or even if you're contributing a patch, um, there it will not be submitted until it meets certain requirements. Um, so even if you don't plan to necessarily uh, contribute back something you're working on, adopting some of the Drupal standards is um, kind of a good practice and it, it helps you build up to the point where you might want to contribute back. A couple short little notes I added, you know, thinking about kind of the themer person or site builder person um, would be, you know, indenting is two spaces. A lot of times like your text editor might indent for a whole tab, but indenting two spaces is the uh, Drupal practice and you can adjust that in your um, text editing settings. Um, no trailing white space, which is also just good for performance reasons because the more spaces there, the just more it takes up. Um, and listing your CSS properties in alphabetical order is another um, one you might consider adopting if you don't already, which basically means if you have like 
color, background, font color, listing in alphabetical order as far as like color would be C and font would font, font would be F. And it's just so it, it, it seems a little bit tedious at first, but when you start to get into it, it, it saves you time because then when you're reading CSS, you sort of know how to look at it. You sort of know what should be at the top and what is the bottom and you don't end up having to read a ton of rules to find like, okay, where's like the font weight in here. Um, so it, it ends up being kind of like a nice mental um, time saver at the, at the end. Um, um, as far as learning more, I get this a lot. People ask me, like, how can I learn more about Drupal? Um, I'm totally new or I'm at this level and I don't really know kind of how to go from here. I point people to books often because I think it's the most comprehensive kind of documentation that's out there. Um, the documentation you find on Drupal.org tends to be really specific to certain issues or to certain modules, but if you're just looking for like overview, like how do I build this kind of site, um, digging into a book will give you that kind of like holistic perspective. Um, training is a really great way to um, learn something new. A lot of the um, camps and cons now have training as kind of a pre-day, a couple days before option. Um, reading and contributing documentation, checking out blogs, videos are a really great way to learn. There's a ton of awesome video services out there that will take you like all the way to module developer status if you want to go there. Um, meetups, camps and cons, like you guys are already here. IRC is another one people might not have really realized is as strong as a resource as it is, but um, there's extensive documentation on Drupal.org on how to get onto IRC and it's essentially like a chat room where you can ask people questions or discuss different issues on Drupal. Um, and overall, just the spirit of willingness, giving back and helping to each other, helping each other out, I think goes a really long way. And I think that's why a lot of people um, end up, you know, in the Drupal community over the long term. Um, there's a kind of cliche saying that people come for the code and stay for the community. Um, but I really believe that that spirit is true, that people really do like in this community will go out of your way to help you and to help you learn and just connecting to that energy and being willing to help other people, it just makes the whole, uh, the whole community grow in a really positive way. So that's all I have for you. I wanted to leave some time as far as like if anyone has questions um, or just want us to like discuss something with the group um, as far as maybe something you've learned um, that's a good practice that maybe you're doing the wrong way and now you're doing the right way and you're really glad you know about it or if there's anything anyone wants to share or ask. Uh, I welcome you to do so. Sure. Things I have done wrong. <laughs> if you're using addresses and you have to choose between locations and address fields, do not use locations. Use address fields even though it's harder. That was my lesson number one. Uh, lesson number two, if you haven't discovered entity references yet, please do. I just finished about 50 hours of copying and pasting because I didn't find out about entity references in time. Um, if you're installing a Drupal site, it defaults with installing a single site. You're probably going to regret doing that. Install it as a multi-site even if you only have one site because you're going, if, for mirroring purposes, None of your images will show up if you if you mirror them. So you're probably going to want to install multi-site. Those are my three top lessons. Nice, thanks. Nobody else has made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Got a room full of experts. Has anyone found like a resource that they really? Helped them, or a certain way of, yeah. Uh, Ledger.com is probably one of the best video training sites for Drupal, especially. Nice. I started with Ledger.com. That was very helpful. IRC useless for newbies. Mm. Drupal I, support is on that channel. I really like it. I find that they'll help you if it's complex questions, but for simple questions, the attitude is I'm trying to help the newbies. And there is a community channel just. And that one's a little bit better for uh, introductory. I'm going to go for a lot of Oh, really? Just not the support? Just regular Drupal? Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm going to support. Just hash Drupal, I think. Yeah. 
community. That's better for you. This is the yeah. Oh, thank you. What was the video site you mentioned? Linda, L Y N D A dot com. Subscription. Yeah, it's like 25 bucks a month. Buildamontual.com yeah. has some really good stuff. Drupalize Me has really good stuff. The Drupal over easy is a guy from England. He has some good ones. Limited selection of them. <clears throat> also, all the uh, dev comments, mm -hmm. they really go back and archive all the sessions. So if you search for like DevCon 2011, 2009, mm -hmm. go back and look at the sites and go to the sessions, a lot of the sessions are used. These are all being recorded as well. Exactly. Mustard Seed Media is another good one. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah, Lullabot Drupalize Me. Yeah. And they are a blog. They do a lot of great blogging. All right, guys. Well, thank you for coming. And um, if anyone wants to ask me anything like individually, I'll just hang out for the next five minutes until the next session. But um, enjoy the rest of your camp. <laughs>